How you feeling, girl? Like you're watching me. Mm hmm? Like you're watching me? No. I always feel like somebody's watching me. Every state, township, and village has its share of myths and legends. Some are based in fact, while others were created to make us behave as children. Our team of researchers and investigators will search out your local stories from historic sites to things that you'll bump in the night. We are the ones who bump back. These are Living History's Mysteries. We're here tonight at the Masonic Temple in Three Oaks, Michigan. There's been a few stories about this place. So Mark, Christy, and I, we hooked up with a friend of ours who's a member of the temple. We decided to come over and check it out. Evening, everyone. As Drew says, we're here at the Three Oaks Masonic Lodge. Before Andrew talks about the Freemasonry, um, I got I did a little research on the Three Oaks Masonic Lodge and a little bit of that. Um, Masonic Lodge started back in January 8th, 1868. It's located Three Oaks, Michigan, uh, Lodge number 239. Um, it's been celebrated 150 years back from two, uh, 2018. Their founder, Henry uh, Chamberlain. Uh, a little bit of in uh, information on Mr. Chamberlain. He has been identified with the order since 1854, Grand Master of the State of Michigan in 1872. Served as the first master of Three Oaks Mill Lodge. He was also a Knights Templar. Uh, Drew will talk, uh, Andrew will talk a little bit about what the Knights Templar was and how they were affiliated with the Freemasonry. Um, this wasn't the uh, original building. They had been moved three different times. The first uh, site was at the hardware store. Uh, the second one was at the Viola restaurant area in Three Oaks, which that used to be the former Oddfellows Lodge on South Elm. Um, the building we're at now was constructed by the Gable family in 1919. The lodge worship master at the time was Edward Dreyer. Um, he was one of the founders of Dryer Meat Market, which still stands today. So if anyone is in Three Oaks, stop at the Dryer's Meat Market, grab some of their uh, amazing cracker bread and their cheese. Good place. As you know, I've been, I grew up in this area, lived on Dryer's stuff all my life. Um, a loan was purchased by, uh, by like I said, by Dryer. It was uh, secured by member C.K. Warren, E.K. Warren's son. The furniture still used today came from the Henderson Ames Company. Now, as they were going to get dedicated, the officers of the Grand Lodge inspected the facility to make sure the rooms were well arranged and work of Freemasonry, using traditional Masonic tools, the level and the plum, prior to the dedication. Now, the ceremony included the spilling of corn, wine, and oil on the altar in the center of the lodge from uh, brass vessels. So, and there you have it, the history of Masonic Lodge of Oaks. I actually wanted to set up and film in this hallway uh, before we continued with any interviews. Um, Masonic member Andrew McGregor says this is one of 
two very active areas. Uh, this hallway runs along the side of the temple itself, uh, down to the uh, mess hall and into the restroom area. There's also a 70s telephone uh, right behind the camera, which has been reported to often ring, even though the telephone is not hooked up to any outlet. As you can see on this video, there is a lot of orb activity, and there are mysterious footsteps also reported. The reason I want to film this hallway is just a few moments ago when Andrew was uh, showing me where the most activity has been here in the temple. Um, right back at the end of this hallway is a door it opens this direction. There's a shadow cast on the wall behind that door. The only place that could come from is the main room, which I just checked out, and no one is in there to cast a shadow. But we are seeing a lot of orb activity right here in this hallway. So we'll probably do a lot of our concentrating in this area uh, while we're here. A lot of skeptics and naysayers would say that a lot of what we are seeing is dust, being such an old building. Anyone who is familiar with a Masonic temple knows it is kept like a palace. It is cleaned immaculately on a regular basis. This is not dust. I visually confirmed there is no dust particles present on any flat surfaces anywhere in this temple. Jeez Louise, I'm picking up orbs everywhere. I, we, I bet we've picked up 20 of them so far. And there's one right before you turn it off. Right there. <coughs> one just moves right up here. Well, there's another one. Welcome to Three Oaks Lodge number 239. I'm glad to be here with the uh, members of Living History's Mysteries. And I'm going to give a talk today about Freemasonry, what it is and who we are as Masons, why you would join, the process of joining, and things that someone could expect once they enter a lodge. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour of our lodge room and explain some of what you see here because it's very strange to the outside eyes. Okay, for someone that's wanting to join Freemasonry, they must ask. They're not, it's never by invite, you ask us. It's important that you came to us. You would sign a petition, you'd fill out a petition, and then that gets turned into the lodge. They assign brothers, to come and visit you and your significant other to answer any questions that she might have as well as you um, because there are many, many um, people think, you know, that we do all kinds of strange things so we try to alleviate any concerns that we're doing anything untoward in here. Um, but once they come in and investigate you and your family and they question you about your motives for joining and get to know you. They come back and report to the lodge um, and then the lodge votes on admitting you to the brotherhood. Once that's done, a, you know, an appointment to, is made with that candidate to come and receive his entered apprentice degree, which is his initiation rites. 
Now, um, this comes into the question of ritual. Why rituals? Ritual takes this man who has his own standing in the world and it eliminates from his person all the trappings of the world that give him outside rank. His street clothes are taken. He's put in a different kind of clothing. He is hoodwinked or blindfolded as it may appear to the outside world. He has a cable toe around his neck that looks like a noose to some folks. Um, and he's led into the lodge and undergoes very strange ritual. And he is placed in the hands of his, bro his future brothers and he must trust them. And at this point, he you know, once he has undergone the first degree, which is called the entered apprentice, entered apprentice degree, he will go to the second degree after completing what's called a proficiency that proves he's learned everything that is taught in the entered apprentice degree. And then he would come back and go through the fellow craft, which is the second degree in Freemasonry. Once again, he will have things that he must learn and commit to memory. And he comes back before the lodge and proves again that he made it, you know, he made it through as a, a fellow craftsman. And at this point, in this lodge, the crowning moment is the Master Mason degree, where he is raised a Master Mason. And this ceremony is the highest that is attainable in this lodge. This lodge here is a blue lodge, and you will see at the ceiling, the blue ceiling representing the sky. And a blue lodge only confers the three degrees of Freemasonry, the first three. Beyond that, you have to apply to the different bodies of Freemasonry, either the Scottish Rite or the York Rite. Now, once he is a full member of our lodge as a Master Mason, he can choose to become an officer of our lodge, which is serving in the various roles aiding in ritual. Um, he would start with these chairs over here as a steward. There's various duties that they have to perform as junior and senior steward. And each one of these chairs has to be filled, you know, by that person for a full year. Sometimes there's been rare occasions where they did not sit in it for the full year because of a death in our line and they had to be moved up. Once you complete these, you would come to these chairs here in the lodge. This is the junior deacon, and he aids the senior warden in various duties. From this position, he would go to the east, to the right hand of the worshipful master, as the senior deacon. And this is a very important role as he is in charge of leading any incoming brothers that are going through their degrees, he leads them literally by the hand through their rituals and initiations. Now, people hear the word ritual, and many things come to mind that are erroneous, you know, knives, altars, black hoods and robes. This is nonsense, none of that happens here. Why ritual is because it's binding. It's very powerful for the candidate as he goes through and, and it's isolating. It focuses his mind on what he's learning and it is something he will share forever with the brothers that are in here with him who are also going through the degree with him as they help confer light upon him. It is at this altar in the center of the room where Every candidate kneels and swears his oaths to God and his brothers to keep the secrets of the fraternity. Um, he swears on that, you know, the holy book in front of him there. Um, and there are things that you see in this lodge room that are common to every single Masonic lodge. You will see the checkerboard floor. This is a representation of the ground floor of King Solomon's temple. 
the black and white squares are emblematic of the light and darkness that we all must walk through in this life. You will see here in the West these two pillars, the two brazen pillars. Um, on their tops, you will see globes, of, you know, terrestrial globe of the, the lands of the earth and the celestial globe showing the stars up above. These two pillars were representative of two pillars that were on the porch of King Solomon's temple built 3,000 years ago. And Freemasonry traces its history to that point and considers King Solomon our first Grand Master. And some of the things that um, people have heard about us are true. Um, you may have heard that in the third degree, we ritualistically murder one of our brothers, and this is true. And if you hear this, it sounds dark or evil. Why would you do this? In that degree, the brother represents the Grandmaster Architect, Hiram Abiff, who was murdered because he would not give up the secrets of Freemasonry to junior workers who were not entitled to them. And in this ritual, that candidate plays the part of Hiram Abiff. And he is slain ritualistically in that manner and dies in the degree. And the degree is put on for his benefit. And he is then at the end of it raised from the dead symbolically as a master mason. Raised, one would say, from being a man into being a mason. And at this point, you know, this is a, you know, this is a life-changing moment. Freemasonry, for me personally, was something that made me want to live a different life. Um, Freemasonry is a, you know, people ask, what is Freemasonry? You'll also, you know, you'll all the time get the enigmatic answer that we are a peculiar system of morality illustrated by symbols and, you know, veiled in allegory. And what does that mean? Well, it's a clever way of, you know, Mason telling you he doesn't want to explain anything because he doesn't know what he can say and what he can't. <laughs> so what it is, is a esoteric discipline. Freemasonry uses these working tools. You will see our common symbol here, the square and the compass. In this case, there's a moon in there. But the square and the compass are tools that are made, of, made use of by operative masons in the building of walls, bricks, you know, the, thing, you know, the construction of buildings. Freemasonry teaches the mason to use these tools, as we say, for the more noble and glorious purposes of divesting our minds and consciences of, you know, the things that trap us, the superfluities of life. All right, as you guys could see, the EMF detector was, was high mid-range, um, especially right there around the door in the bookshelf. I'm going to look at the parallels real quick and see what we can figure out there. center of the door. Scanning. Greetings, brothers. Listen very closely here in a moment. You will hear a long, drawn-out breath that seems to emanate from the walls. in here you can almost hear disembodied conversations of brothers past
you look closely around the room, you will see shadows cast on the back walls and a lot of orb activity. At this point in time, Christy and I are the only ones in this area, and we're both standing back behind the camera as a source of light. Is anybody here? Is anybody here with us? If you listen very closely, you're getting a noise, almost like a breathing that starts down here and works its way all the way down the trim at the top of the wall. We view ourselves as a stone taken from the rough ground, just a chunk of stone. And then we apply the tools of Freemasonry to turn ourselves into a building block fit to be used by the master's hands. Um, because at the center of Freemasonry, the belief is that I can't go into the world and make it a better place without having first made myself a better man. You know my friend Hiram?
Yes. I have journeyed a long way. Yes, I was. One time. And this is true. I mean, how, you know, if you haven't, you know, how can you go, you know, how can you do that? You could do it on certain levels, but there are ways that you are taught and instructed here that you will not receive in the rest of the world. These are things that, you know, the, the, the way in which you are taught our lessons are memorable and will be memorable for you until the day you die. It is a life-changing moment in any man's life that chooses to join us. We are the world's oldest existing fraternity. Um, we do have secrets. Um, when you join, are you going to be told where the Roswell ship is or who killed Kennedy? No. Some of the secrets that we tell you that you must keep will seem rather small. A grip, you know, a, a word. And these are small things, but if I can trust you not to show somebody how I shook your hand or the name that this grip has. I know that I can trust you with the bigger things in life. Is anyone here with me? I really hope you guys are seeing this orb activity. There are a lot of orbs in this building. We're gonna go back out here in the main hallway with the, uh, with the red light. Okay, I'm shooting from the dining hall down toward entrance. There's a light down here at the end. It looks like a yard light or something coming in the window, but it's changing colors on here. If you want to turn any of them lights out front off, go ahead. Oh no, I, I want that light coming in so I can pick up any shadows. Okay.
I was starting to say I just moved around an angle and seen something move on the other side. Picking up some orbs. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I saw that move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one. There ain't no bugs in here. Mm -mm. No, there could be dust, obviously. Well, and see, I originally thought dust, and I don't mind saying that where the camera can pick me up. I first thought dust, but I'm seeing it coming down, going up, mm -hmm. moving this way. Yeah, dust is. It's like, wait a second, it's all going to blow the same direction. And it's not going to go like sonic fast, too. It's, it's going to leave, hover or linger or something. I had one when he was talking in here earlier that actually just crept. Right across the bottom of the screen. I mean, it couldn't have been doing it. Couldn't have been doing a quarter of a mile an hour. It was so slow. God, we're picking up a lot of orbs. Okay, I'm going to try something. What do you got? A pain in the butt. Studying or whatever I was doing, it's always out in the periphery. Sometimes I'll hear what sounds like somebody in that room, and then you'll hear footsteps out there in the hall, you know, or out in the front or down, you know, especially up and down this hallway. And then, like I said, that phone rings on occasion. I, I just can't believe the orb activity. I, I'm it's blow it's blowing me away. That one there was just plain as day, come right up on the floor and then came right up well there's where's my hand at? There it is. Came right up that way and it, it almost like dissipated as it got up in this area. sits on this table behind the door into the rectory as decoration. There is no wire plugged into any phone jack, no power source going to this phone whatsoever. How it rings mysteriously, how it's reported ringing by the brothers of the masonry still remains a mystery.
this point in time, Christy is in the restroom there at the end of the hall. Mason McGregor and Mark S. are in the dining hall directly to the left of that bathroom door, and I am in the hallway with the camera equipment. Watch what happens. Yeah, I walked down the hall again. Where's that bathroom? I wanna see. Now my question is, when you walk past that coat right there on the end, did you brush it with your arm? Since Christy just walked through the most active area I have seen in the temple uh, thus far, I wanted to pull out the EMP meter and see if uh, she had any residual magnetic 
residue on her. Uh, at this point in time, I am getting a uh, 25.0 uh, magnetic reading. As I move closer to her, it actually picks up into the 40 point zero range behind her I can actually get up to 42 for just about her entire silhouette as I pull the meter away from her it actually drops back down into the 25.0 range In my opinion, this is proof that you can track the magnetic resonance and the magnetic residue through some type of paranormal contact. TC Legion pair loose loaded. Scanning. Records. What about records? What records? You heard that too. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's exactly where the arrow is pointing right now, is up. Who's here with us? Catherine. Could you explain Catherine? Her mom's name is Catherine. Scanning stop. Say what? Her mom's name is Catherine. Which is really kind of funny because the, that way. because the arrow is pointing right towards you. <laughs> That's a little ironic. It was spelled exactly the way she spelled it. Really? Which I don't see very often. Scanning. I'm going to have to zoom in so you guys can see that on film. But 
as soon as I get right here between these two mirrors, across from each other, this arrow starts to go crazy. I demand to know who's here with me. As a matter of fact, I'm laying that down right there. We're going to have us a little interdimensional fun. Into. up again. Important. Important. Scientists, in a sense, I don't know if I just saw what I think I just saw, but I seen an orb just a second ago come up the right side of the camera and cast a shadow. Noise. Noise. Yes, we're getting a lot of noise. Listen, as Mason McGregor says something about making noise, and I respond to him by singing it back to him. As I finish, something whistles, audible enough that Christy can hear it. And as she turns to look in the direction of the noise, a light anomaly flies out of the room past her. We're gonna make some noise. Okay, I'm going to set this right here to monitor the hallway where they hear footsteps and stuff all the time. We've been hearing noises coming out of this hallway. Um, if you listen, I think the mic is pointing in the correct direction. You will hear the door popping and cracking as if it's opening. I'm going to go ahead and leave the hallway and let the uh, Milligoss reader um, do its job. I'll be back in a few.
Yeah, that door just like opened. Yeah, it opened. If he's down there. Okay. I think that's where he went. No, this one here. Yeah. The door to the lodge. It opened. We didn't touch it mm -mm. at all. We were right there. Yeah, we were just standing yeah. right here. And, and all of a sudden we heard the click and then it opened. Because mm -hmm. right about the time I heard seconds. him open that door downstairs in a few days. I mean, there's, this building is old and drafty, but like I'm telling you, I still, <laughs> I'm not going to write it all off to the wind and rain. This is, I'm telling you, it gets busy. There are people that move through here. All this building genius is like 1920. Yeah, all and, you know, and you know, as far as like being a Masonic lodge, you know, four more years, and you're talking about a hundred years of people passing through. Mm -hmm. Lots of people. And I'm not talking, you know, just our brothers. You know, it's visitors. It's it's anybody. I mean, it's. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Half these buildings are been built since. 19th, 18th, and 20th century. We're in the hallway now. We were in earlier, pointing down towards the restroom. We're going to see. We're going to leave it alone here for just a moment, see what we get. I'm going to walk down the hallway, see if I can get any kind of a reading or an increase in the milligoss. By walking down through there. Well, that was almost unusual. I can look at a brother Mason and go, I know things about him. I don't have to really have met the guy, but to hear that he's a Mason, I know certain things about him. And this is things that can be true about, you know, almost every Mason you meet. Have we had black sheep in our fraternity that have given us black eyes? Absolutely. Every organization does. Um, so... Essentially, this is what our mission is, is to 
take men who are interested in becoming better and are looking to find, you know, the way, I, the, this is the way I describe it. It's like becoming, it's like entering the priesthood of your own beliefs. We believe that you were a Mason before you came here. You were a Mason in your life already and in your heart. You were, you just needed to go through the formality of joining us and having us bring you through. In conclusion, our investigation of the Masonic Temple in Three Oaks, Michigan has provided more than enough evidence that the legends and the stories are true and that over a hundred years of activity and many hundred members have walked through these doors. Some decided to never leave. This was a great investigation. We'd like to thank the Three Oaks Lodge and Mason Andrew McGregor for showing us around.